What's the craziest thing you've ever seen in the sky? I saw a comet Neowise for a brief second, and that's probably the coolest thing I'll ever see. That's probably it. Shooting stars? Nah. Comets? Way to go, there we go. Welcome back to Bumblebee. We got one that's out of this world today. Here are the top 10 historical space discoveries that you need to see. Kicking off our list at number 10, Plasma Shield. You'll need your tinfoil hats for this entire video. I'll just start by saying that. The thumbs up and the tinfoil hats, both equally as important. Billions of miles from the center of our solar system, there's a wall, big Game of Thrones space wall. Beyond this wall, what's over there? We have no idea, really. It's like the boundaries of an old video game. It's just blurry and it's mysterious. There's some sort of energy that protects us from deep space radiation. There has to be. And when NASA's twin Voyager probes passed through this exact region only three years ago, astronomers saw that the heliopause is a physical wall of plasma that deflects away the worst radiation in the cosmos. So yeah, a big gooey wall is protecting us from aliens and radiation. That's pretty cool. It's not a hypothetical anymore. The Voyager passed by recently. The shield may actually deflect about 70% of cosmic rays from entering our own solar system. I can't even comprehend the size here. That's just the start too. We're only finding out more things. James Webb is here to fuck shit up. Number nine, dead planets. When a star runs out of fuel, it can become a white dwarf. It's the skeleton of a star, essentially. Any planet that's orbiting that star at that point, it's toast. It's probably gonna get wiped out in the final growth spurt of the star. We expect this exact scenario to happen to us here on Earth. We're going to get swallowed by our expanding sun. Yeah, spoilers. Sorry. Either that or its intense gravity would pull us all into our own hot demise. Both pretty bad, but also pretty pretty quick. Only a couple years ago, astronomers discovered an intact planet still orbiting a white dwarf star for the first time ever. This was impossible up until this point. This odd orbit sits 2,040 light years from us here on Earth, and the white dwarf system has its own Neptune-like planet that is slowly evaporating. It's disappearing every 10 days. That's a full orbit over there, just 10 days. Yeah, happy new years, good game. Also, we're disappearing, that's lovely. It's depressing, but this brings light a new theory, that dead stars can actually host planets, even if it's only for a short amount of time. And then, you know, it evaporates us and swallows us whole and burns us. Well, one of the three, it's all gonna suck. Number eight, solar tsunami. I've seen this one here on Reddit a few times and it's baffling each and every time. Some folk on Reddit actually believe that shadow beings live in the sun and that this is actually footage of an alien leaving our sun. Solar flares look odd, but I don't think that it's a quick pit stop for aliens, you know. I'm not totally convinced either way, I don't know. In February, 2019, researchers described a solar phenomenon called Terminator events, which first of all, jarring name, Terminator, okay? These Terminator events are massive magnetic field collisions at the sun's equator. Now, subsequently, these collisions result in twin tsunamis of plasma tearing across the star's surface. It travels at a thousand feet per second. It's pretty fast. It's kind of like the tsunami scene from Interstellar, only way, way worse, totally way worse. Solar tsunamis could last for weeks at a time and may occur once a decade. So keep your eyes peeled. No, actually don't look at the star. Don't look at any star ever for that matter, especially not ours or you'll go blind. Number seven, lost habitable worlds. Remember back in 2020 when we casually discovered phosphine on Venus? Yeah, in the middle of 2020 of all time, data from 40 years ago resurfaced and it was documents from an old NASA mission where they may have overlooked this phosphine for the entire time. Yeah, whoops, didn't see that sign of life there for 40 years, found it, let's talk. Yeah, this compound of phosphorus and hydrogen, this is eye-opening, so what's next? Well, NASA is interested to say the least. They're currently preparing to launch two new missions to Venus to check this out. This is part of NASA's discovery program that they're launching in 2030, so we still got a little bit of time. The Da Vinci Plus and the Verita S. Now the first one is a deep atmosphere Venus investigation of noble gases, chemistry, and imaging. Kind of a mouthful, but that's why we say Da Vinci. There we go. Then the second one, the second drone, will map Venus's surface and study its geologic history and hopefully get an understanding as to what happened to such a lost habitable world. World. Yeah, maybe there's humans there. Maybe we got old and we died and then we came here. Oh, number six, carbon on Mars. It's one thing to have Elon tweeting about going to Mars, but when NASA talks about it, it's interesting. I get an eerie feeling. I'm like, oh, I kind of believe this a little bit more. Elon's Twitter is a little off the chain, so more than fair. They're old school, you know what I mean? They're like, we may have found carbon 40 years ago. Stay tuned. Papers everywhere. It's so NASA to have papers all over the place when you discover something. Well, in 2022, quite recent, just back in January, NASA's Curiosity rover measured carbon signatures on Mars. And we got Venus, we got Mars. What's next? Earth? 
Yeah, gotcha. Paul Mahaffey, principal investigator of the sample analysis over at Mars, he says, quote, we're finding things on Mars that are tantalizingly interesting, but we would really need more evidence to say we've identified life. Okay, so we're close. We're definitely close. We need more evidence, not all the evidence. We just need a little bit more. And then we're finding aliens up on Mars, the big red planet. Imagine going to Mars with Elon Musk. Like imagine like winning a trip and that's what you get. I would pay millions of dollars to not do that. How does that sound? Number five, asteroid redirection. This one happened like a week ago and it snuck up on all of us. It has Michael Bay written all over it. I was pretty excited for this project, I'm not gonna lie. NASA landing a craft onto a moving asteroid is one thing, but their asteroid redirection mission was next level. Their plan was for NASA to catch an asteroid using hypothetically a large space inflatable and no, I'm not joking. And then they would move said asteroid to the moon where it would orbit for their studies. Yeah, we're just gonna adopt a rock and then have astronauts land on it and then study the moon. I don't think this is gonna happen, but just last week, NASA landed a craft onto an asteroid. They just blasted an asteroid, so ideally, down the line, if we need to, we can blow an asteroid that's coming towards Earth off its orbit, so it misses us. I don't know. That seems a bit more easy than a giant inflatable catching a rock and then letting it go over here. You know what I mean? Let's just blast the thing. I'm on board with NASA. Number four, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmentano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. I can't imagine anything worse than this. Here we go. It was July 16th, 2013. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not water, but even worse. It started to fill with liquid coolant. Yeah, zero G coolant floating around inside of your mask. That's horrible. Water would be bad. Coolant, you don't want to breathe or drink this in. It's all bad. But being in space, that's a bit unpredictable. You know what I mean? The spacewalk continued for over an hour before Luca was back in the ISS and free from his suit of doom. He was fine, but this accident could have been a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. Yeah, more than fair. Imagine drowning in like zero G. Ah. Horrible. Number three, Apollo 13. April 11th, 1970, Apollo 13 was heading for the moon. Now on board the ship was astronauts James Lovell, John Swigert, and Fred Hayes. 56 hours after takeoff, there was an explosion that damaged the shuttle drastically. Every system to keep the astronauts alive and well were all of a sudden no longer operational. And yes, they were all in space heading towards the moon. So worst scenario possible. The second oxygen tank thermostat had been damaged before the actual launch. And since it blasted off, these astronauts had little to no chance of ever coming home. There's actually a movie about this whole thing and it's wild. You have to watch it. It's a Tom Hanks classic. No spoilers, but incoming spoilers. Their power supply, water, oxygen, heat, and light all cut off. They had lost over 30 pounds combined. It was horrible. It was just quite the event. The people at NASA's Mission Control Center had to get these guys home and do months work of calculations in only days. Instead of going to the moon, they figured a way to use its pull and then return home as quickly and as safely as possible. So they did a little moon flyby said, oh, would be nice, see ya. Then they flew back, terrified this whole time, and then went back to Earth. Number two, space animals. We often remember Laika, the space dog, and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2, but does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why are we talking about these two? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years later, so it wasn't the first animal, so, you know, maybe that's why we don't talk about it. But it was two years later, May 28th, 1959. The United States launched a female rhesus monkey named Abel and a female squirrel monkey named Baker. They launched them both into space. Now this mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home, which is great. You're probably all curious what happened right off the bat. The monkeys weren't injured from their trip, or so they say, although they were whipping through space at 10,000 miles an hour. I highly don't believe that. This was 1959. This was when space travel became the real deal. The impossible became possible. And it was all because of these animals right here. Abel sadly passed away after the flight in you know, normal ways, nothing to do with the actual flight itself. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 letters a day. I'm talking fan mail. These ladies are icons, okay? Never mind Laika. Laika's time's over, okay? We get it. It was rough. Rough, we like it, dog puns. That's why we're here. Hit that thumbs up for dog puns and also animals in space. Number one, runaway bride. Back in September 2019, a star was detected at impossible speeds. It was just whipping through the cosmos. It was the fastest renegade star ever recorded so far. Hey, you wanna know how fast you were going? It was fleeing across the Milky Way at 1.2 million miles per hour. I'm trying to imagine that and I can't. Where did this even come from? Well, most of the time, these speeds come right after a supernova explosion, but after tracking 
the star's velocity and trajectory and going, eh, it came from there. Researchers figured out where it came from. It came from a black hole that's massive. It's hundreds of thousands of times the mass of our own sun, and this star just got completely sucked in and then launched out at unimaginable speeds. That thing, like, is this gonna hit us? How many more are out there? This is so scary. I'm gonna get out of here right now. I'm feeling a little hot with all these lights. I'm a little scared. Now I'm thinking about space, and now I'm anxious. I've been Taylor McWaters. We'll see you next time on Bumblebee for some more out-of-this-world facts. Hit that thumbs up. Bye.